Hi guys, if it's Tuesday, it's Down and Dirty Woodcraft. Stay with me. Okay, today guys, we're going to have another little story time because I'm going to give you a little window, okay? Like old Paul Harvey said, the rest of the story. Recently, I had a very good discussion with my good friend Mike Denny, and we were talking about water purification and how he would go through, they'd take the bandanas and they put the layer of the grass and the layer of the sand and the layer of the charcoal and etc. And I said how sometimes that's not necessary in the right conditions. And so we talked about conditions. So I'm going to spread that conversation on to you. But what we need to talk about first, I need to give you a little backstory. Okay. First of all, let's look at the fact that the Earth's surface that we're standing on is made up of layers, okay? Like layers of a cake. Each one of those layers are laid down at the conditions that are prevalent when it's on the surface. So, right now this is a swamp. You'll have leaf bed, sediment, and everything coming to the bottom. It dries out. It becomes a hard packed, fertile plain. That gets layers of sand and dust on it. That becomes another layer. This lands on top of that. Eventually there's sandstone. And each time the layer is added to the top, it compresses the layer beneath and locks that layer together. So that when you do a cross section of any amount of dirt, you're going to see layers. You know, maybe a micro thin one or feet thick. It just depends on what the conditions were at this time. Now, let us look about how those layers affect what we're talking about. First of all, there's a bad representation of the continental United States. But it gives us an idea where to start. Out here in the North Atlantic, there's a place where the tectonic plates of the earth are created. There, the plates are actually coming up and doing like that, one going to Europe, one going to America. Right in the middle of it, you have Iceland, okay? And it's where this separating, and that plate is emerging out of the earth at about the same rate your fingernails grow. On the other end of that plate is North America. And where those two butt heads, that, is what we call the Smoky Mountains. That's where these layers coming this way are hitting these layers that way, and they're doing that and being forced up. As this pressure is applied, it bows up and forms the Smokies. As it does, this edge that's now brought to the top is becoming weathered due to the steepness and weather, and it flows back down here, adding new layers. So the layer that was on the bottom eventually becomes the top and gets flopped to being on the top of the next layer. This is deposited over long-term time. But that plate's not done. That plate hits this plate. This center plate pushes and then over here, you have the Rocky Mountains, where this plate is pushing up to this plate, and they're pushing up. And then right here in California, you have the San Andreas Fault, where the Pacific plate is not pushing. It's rotating. And this plate is going underneath that plate. So it's sort of like a slow car wreck of boom, boom, boom. Okay. The dirt emerging out of the center of the Atlantic is pushing against the American plate, which is bowing up. It formed the Smokies, which is now reacting, which is forming the Rockies. The Rockies are still growing. The Smokies are not. That push has changed, see? It uh, uh. Well, now you've got the block on the other side of the Rockies is pushing against the Pacific plate, and all the earthquakes and etc. are happening out there. This gives you an idea of what the ground composition is. It's going to be layers. It's going to be moving plates and pieces. That's a Cliff Notes idea 
of what North America geologically is doing. Yes, there's a whole lot of other things. I'm not going to talk about Yellowstone and everything. I could spend the next three weeks talking about this. But what we're talking about here is why the ground around us has these upheavals, why it has these detections, why it has these cracks, etc. That's the overall engine driving it. Okay? And then you add in rain and weathering, etc. So now let's go to our second actor in our party. And that is water evaporating from the oceans. It's heated up. This water vapor evaporates up, forms clouds. This is brought onto the land and deposited as freshwater rain. This rain then falls upon those geologic features that we just talked about. And how it reacts with them makes a difference. So, let us say that we are up here in uh, Kentucky, let's say. And we have mountains. Okay? You got a big old mountain up here and it works its way around over there. You know, big old ridge running across the top. Rain falling on the top of it. The layers that make up that mountain were deposited way back as different things, remember, as seafloors, whatever. And are they permeable or non-permeable? Permeable means the water will simply go through it like a sponge. Non-permeable means it's so tightly packed it can't go through it. So this rainwater falling onto this mountain, a good deal of it's going to just run off, but some of it is absorbed to what degree? If you've got an, a rocky mountain that is made up of very dense, non-permeable rock, then the water will filter down through cracks. But what if you got something that's made out of sandstone or something like this? The water more readily percolates down that. So you get more and more water inside this mountain. Okay? So, here we have a mountain, and then we have a tapering valley right here. Inside of this mountain, the water percolates down to point X. And right there, it reaches a non-permeable layer. That may have been ancient seafloor. That may be a type of rock. That may have been a lava flow. That whatever. But the water trickling down through the rock eventually hits something it can't go through. And like a tile floor, it ain't going nowhere. Well, it can't evaporate because it's so deep down. There's no exchange of that. So water is never dull, and water always goes downhill. It requires a lot of pressure to go uphill. It can, but it always wants to go downhill. So our water hits this layer. It's downhill that way, right? So even inside the mountain, the water starts working its way downhill. And so right here at this layer, water emerges out of the mountain and starts trickling along the surface. That's what we call a spring or a seep, depending on the flow. If it's fairly fast water, then it's a spring. If it's just a little drip, 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 that's a seep. How long did it take that water from the time it fell on the top of this mountain to the time it emerges, how long did it take it to percolate through that rock? That's a big question. It may have been there hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands, or millions of years, depending on the composition of that rock and that soil. Okay? How long it takes to get through there. Do you think there's anything alive in that water when it emerges? No. Anything biological would be an extreme fluke. There's very few life forms that can exist. Yes, there are some. But there are very few life forms that can exist in those conditions without sunlight, without oxygen. 
for that length of time that could just simply breed and eat what? There's nothing there. So our biological in that water is extremely limited. But once it breaks the surface, now it's exposed to our environment, which is a cesspool of biological contamination. So as that water emerges from underneath that rock, it's just a trickle, and it starts moving down this valley, what most people see when they look at it is, oh, it's a small stream. That's not what Blackie sees. Let me show you what I see. For that stream to emerge in that valley down there, you have your mountain again, and then you've got this valley that's a slow taper. The water is percolated down, and right along here, it's reached its point that it's got to come out. It comes out, and it runs along the surface. But what if it doesn't come out before it gets out of that mountain. What if it goes down here and below the mountain, 10 feet down, mean elevation? That is where that non-permeable layer is. Well, the water hits it and it starts flowing downhill, right? It's got to go downhill. And what does the water do as it flows downhill? Well, any V or natural depression in the earth, that's downhill, isn't it? Water always flows downhill. And it will seek the easiest route. So it goes into this ancient depression that was God knows what, 50,000, 100,000 years ago, and it goes into that, and it's non-permeable. It can't penetrate it, but it can go into it, and it starts flowing, and the water's flowing into that, and they're flowing together, and the volume of water increases okay so it is not just a trickle of water here what you're seeing in this mountain valley is this I have a valley and right here I have my stream flowing Okay, it's coming toward me. What I don't see is from here, this is the water table. What this is, is a skylight to the water table, okay? All of this out here on the side is actually, if I was to draw it like this, here's the surface, here is the water table. Here is the non-permeable layer. This has now, due to erosion, because remember that flow was flowing out. And as it does, it's eroding the roof. The roof starts to sag in under weight. And the ground subducts down until it breaks the surface. And we have a stream. So right here, at the highest flow point, we have created a surface stream that we can see right there. What we can't see is the rest of this water table going around it. Now, when I see a stream, that tells me the surface water is that, the water table is that close to the surface. How deep is it? How deep is the water? Is the water a foot deep, six inches deep, two foot deep, ten foot deep? That's how deep that aquifer, that's how deep that water table is. How wide is it? It may be a mile wide right there, but this was the highest flow. And as the water cuts, we tend to think of it like a water hose. I pour the water here and it runs down. Well, that's a surface erosion. But this is not a surface erosion. This is a subsurface erosion. And you can tell the difference this way. If you look at the walls of the stream, if they're a deep V, that is a surface erosion that is cut down to the water table. On the other hand, if it is a 
big wide surface area and the water's in here so big and wide that is a subsurface stream coming to the surface or at one that is started and cut down to it so there's not just water flowing this way there's water flowing in from the sides because that's all of the water table that impermeable layer is cut a skylight into it so when I go up to get water I don't have any means of filtration whatsoever I don't have a purifier or whatever and it's 105 out here I don't want to boil water if I could I mean if I boil that water it's so hot it takes hours for it to cool off I need water now I can either drink the surface water and risk the biological contamination. Sometimes it's worth risk, sometimes it's not. Or I can realize what I'm looking at by the fact it's a wide, shallow stream. That you look at the topography of the ground going away from the stream and it's a, you know, a nice gentle steep up climb. That tells me that the ground is eroded down. This must be a big water course an underground water course, okay? That means what I'm going to do is this. Here is my water table. Here is my ground coming to it. Here is my surface water. How deep the water is tells me how deep that water table is underground. It's not gonna flow up and stay there. That means if that water's a foot deep, the water in the ground is a foot deep. If that water's 10 foot deep, the water in the ground's 10 foot deep around me, okay? But this water is contaminated. It's got a lot of things living in it. If it's a good source of food, it has crawdads, it has frogs, it has salamanders, it has fish, it has snakes. That's a good source of food. It's also a good source of Girardia and stuff like that because it means that area right there has lots and lots of life in it and lots and lots of predators, micro predators like Girardia and amoeba and stuff like that feeding on that, little bitty fishy. But guess what? It doesn't penetrate into the rock very far. So this surface water area probably doesn't penetrate more than two feet, three feet. Let's be generous and say five feet into the rock. That biological contamination can't penetrate that rock. Why? The water's flowing from the rock inward. You ever been to a restaurant or something and you open the door and the wind is blowing in or blowing out? It's hard to open the door. A lot of restaurants, it's hard to open the door because they have these big exhaust fans sucking the heat out of the kitchen area and blowing it up. So you gotta open the door and I mean, it, you gotta pull. Well, that's true here. The water is flowing to that surface stream from all directions to get out. So for that amoeba or something to swim back, and let's look at it. It requires light, it requires oxygen, it requires a food source, which are not abundant in that rock. So he's only gonna be close to the water's edge realistically no more than like two feet due to variances in the uh, how permeable that layer is but at the same time if i go say five feet out of it i come over here and i find a natural depression possibly I, I, what i really want to see is a deep v coming to my stream why that's a surface erosion a deep v steep walls that's already cut down a lot of the overburden for me. And I'm, say, five, six, seven feet out of the water. It's already cut down the surface where it'd be four foot deep of dirt. It's made me have like a foot and a half of dirt in this V. That's where I dig my coyote well. I come right here, five or six feet out of the, away from the water's edge, and I dig straight down I want to dig my coyote well about the size of my hat and I want to go down until I hit the water table. 
being the fact that I'm fairly close to water to begin with, that dirt's going to be fairly soft, right? So a digging stick or a kukri works great. Break up the dirt, take your hand and throw it out. Break up the dirt, take your hand and throw it out. And then you hit water. Well, how do you know you're going to hit water, Blackie? The water table. That surface water is a skylight into a big water table. Yeah, there's going to be water right there. It's right there, it's flowing into it. So I dig straight down and I, when I hit good flowing water, I keep going. I go down another, you know, six, eight inches. I get as much mud out as I can and I stop. It's gonna fill full, full of water. Why? Water is flowing from up here through this dirt rock on this non-permeable layer to this surface stream. It's the same as standing next to a tin roof on a building and throwing a ball up on the roof. Do you think it's gonna come back down? Of course, it's downhill and it'll roll. Water always flows downhill. So if I'm at the surface water, I'm downhill. But since I've gone uphill, so to speak, and I've cut that coyote well, that water flowing in is gonna flush out that silt and we'll go over here and rest a little bit. In 30 minutes, that thing will be clear. Now, how long has that water been in the ground before it got here? Hundreds of years? Thousands of years? A million years? Depends on topography and a lot of other stuff. What are the odds of there being something biologically alive in that water? Pretty low, right? So if I have to drink raw water, why wouldn't I dig that well? At a surface, you know, right there, I got a surface. Yeah. But that water has got plenty of food in it. I'm going to use that for a food source. If I have a filtration system, I'm going to do it. If I've got time and the ability to boil water, I will do that. But I need cool water now. I dig a coyote well. It's far more advantageous than making the tripod with the bandanas and everything else. Because I don't have to filter it. I don't have the risk of a biological in that water. My ratio of having a biological problem and getting Girardi or something else just dropped. Now, it's not zero because you can't know the topography. But it's a very low percentage. And so Blackie can drink that water directly. If I cover up this lid right here so I don't have critters falling into it, I can cover that up. I can come back to it in the morning. I can fill up my canteens again. I can sit there and chug all the water I want drink water until my urine turns clear, which means I'm fully hydrated before I move on. So, in this long-winded story time, understanding that in the ground you have a topography of moving rock, layers, all of that, that it is in the process of moving and eroding right under our feet in a long geologic time that will be long gone. But it's, pro it's right now moving that as that fresh water pours on top of that mountain, eventually it will emerge out from the bottom of that hill, that ridge, whatever. It will go down till it hits the non-permeable layer and that's where it's gonna emerge. And that water should be safe to drink at the source. Right as it's coming out of the ground, like a foot or two out, to clear you out of thing, fill up your canteen cup. The odds of biological contamination are extremely low right there because that water's flowing out. I go to a surface water that it's kind of pond skimmy, it's nasty, it's not crystal clear running water. There's a lot of stuff living in it. I've got a food source and I will step off the side and build me a coyote well because now I've got a source of relatively clean water with a relatively minimum amount of effort. How much effort is it? Well, you build a tripod and stuff. Do you already have charcoal? I don't carry that much charcoal. Most people don't carry that much charcoal. So you would have to create a fire, burn that fire, extinguish that fire to have the charcoal for your thing. I don't have 12 hours to wait. I'll have a well dug and I'll be drinking cool water within the hour. That's my plan. Hope this gives you some ideas, guys. Please leave any questions or comments below. 
And until next time, I'm Blackie wishing you safe journeys. Have a great day, guys.